Hello, everyone. My name is Arik Burkowski. I am the Assistant Director of the Russia and Eurasia Program at the Fletcher School, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you to what promises to be a fascinating panel discussion on the future of European security. Uh, we're delighted today to collaborate with the Center for Strategic Studies at Fletcher on this event. Uh, and uh, uh, we have three distinguished panelists. This conversation will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Fabil Luzin. Uh, Fabil is a visiting scholar at the Fletcher School uh, during this academic year. He's a researcher of Russia's foreign policy and defense, space policy, and global security issues. Uh, he is also a contributor to the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the Jamestown Foundation, and Riddle, which is part of the Intersection Foundation in Lithuania. So, Pavel, the floor is yours. So, uh, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, it is uh, our pleasure to see so many of you here jo joining uh, with us. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, today's topic is not uh, the only academic topic. Uh, it is a practical topic, and uh, this topic is uh, pity enough. And uh, I hope that uh, our panelists uh, will be able to uh, to show us some prospect how to. Um, to increase, to improve the European security in a foreseeable future. Uh, and I hope that um, you will be able to ask them to, uh, I don't know, uh, your questions. And uh, I have to say that um, our second speaker, Vladimir Dubovic, uh, he needs to go in one hour. So uh, after speaker's presentations, please um, uh, give your questions. Uh, just raise a hand, or you may uh, send your questions uh, on chat. But uh, take into account that Vladimir Dubovic will leave us sooner. Uh, so if you want to ask him precisely, uh, take your time and uh, do it before he, he leaves. So um, I think it's time to start. So Benedetta, what do you think? What is your opinion towards the future of the European security? What is your proposals maybe and concerns? So the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think I'll keep, instead of my proposals, maybe I'll give you a little bit of a sense of where NATO is at the moment in terms of thinking about our security environment and where this is going. Um, not because my own personal opinion are, may not be of interest, but perhaps given that we just, as an alliance, were able to agree a new uh, strategic concept over a couple of months ago, maybe I can use that as a starting point. Uh, to think through some of the changes in our security environment and how we're seeing them, um, and of course, uh, and of course, we can we can then take we can then go more into the details because if I'm not mistaken, you just want me to do a very short uh, sort of framing introduction. So in that sense, I think that uh, that your broad question is how do we see the security environment today? What has changed and uh, how do we see the transatlantic space and the Euro Atlantic, the Euro Atlantic security space at the moment? And I think the, the 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 NATO strategy, the strategic concept that was just adopted, is a good starting point to think about that because, uh, well, for once, because it's one of the few documents uh, we have that set that gives you a one-stop shop into how the alliance is thinking about the security environment. What are the threats? What are the challenges? What are the priorities? So it's a good starting point, and also uh, because the a new one was just agreed a couple of months ago and of course he replaced the earlier one that was in that was adopted in 2010 so 12 years had passed in between uh, it's a good starting point also because i think if you compare the two 
uh, the two strategic concepts, if you compare the 2010 and the 2022, you have a very clear and fast way to see how we have changed an, an, the understanding of our security environment. Right. In 2010, the strategic concept of NATO talked about the Euro-Atlantic Arab being a peace. It talked about uh, risk of conventional conflict involving allies being low. It talked about the, the, the aspiration to continue building a strategic partnership with Russia. And uh, significantly, it really talked about how we, our security was going to be challenged, of course, there were going to be threats, there were going to be challenges, but those threats and challenges were going to come from out of area. They were going to come from outside the Euro-Atlantic area, and they were going to come in the forms of uh, asymmetric threats, terrorism, and really the, what we had to do was focus on external uh, crisis management and mission of strategic distance. And of course, at the time, Afghanistan was the largest operational engagement for the alliance. I say all this because I think if you if you compare that assessment of the security environment with the one that the allies just agreed a couple of months ago, it's clear that we are in a different uh, security environment, but I would say even in a different historical period. Uh, the 2022 strategic concept starts by saying, well, the Euro-Atlantic era is not at peace. Peace is no longer something we can take for granted. Uh, the security of our own allies, it's not something we can take for granted. Uh, the possibility of a conventional attack cannot be discounted. So we are in a completely different security environment. In a way, you could think about uh, 1989 to 20 uh, to 2014, I would say, as our post-Cold War period in terms of thinking broadly about security and about out of area. But all that is gone. We're now in a very different environment, post post Cold War period, if you wish, in which and this post post Cold War period is defined by increasing instability, increasing fragility around our neighborhood. Uh, it's defined by a no a conventional all out war being waged at the moment in Europe because of Russia, of course. Uh, it is of course also defined by the fact that the notion that Euro Atlantic space is an area of cooperation and shared principle has been blatantly um, disregarded and violated several times over the, at least over a decade by the Russian Federation. And today we are really in a, in a new security environment in which the rules and principles of the European security order will have one way or another to be redefined or reaffirmed uh, going forward. So that's the, I think that's a very systemic change. We go from an assessment that the Euro-Atlantic area is at peace and that our threats and challenge, main threats and challenges will come from out of area to a very different environment, one in which we say we say that we need to deal with uh, persistent instability, recurrent shocks, uh, a more dangerous and competitive environment. And in light of that, we have to reset ourselves for our capacity to do collective defense. And this is, of course, something that as, that as an alliance we started doing in 2014, and we can talk more about that. But the point is that the emphasis is really shifted and back to collective defense, back to strengthening our ability to do deterrence and defense, back to the ability to shield every inch of a light territory and to prevent an attack on allies. So it's very, very uh, distinct focus. Of course, that also carries a broader reflection on how do we uh, protect the rules-based international order? How do we uh, ensure the protection of our freedom and democracies in a world that is not just marked by um, Russia's aggressive a war of aggression against Ukraine, but is marked more broadly by the resurgence of strategic competition. And that is beyond just uh, the behavior of the Russian Federation in Ukraine or the behavior of the Russian Federation in general. It is really about assertive authoritarian powers more deliberately pushing back against the rules-based international order. It is about being contested across the spectrum from the cyber to the hybrid, to the economic, to the political political to the ideological. And it's, of course, also about a rise in China and its course that policies and impact on your Atlantic security. So it's a completely different assessment, uh, one in which um, we cannot we cannot take, as I said, our own peace for granted. We cannot afford failure of imaginations when it comes to our own security. And that's why, really, as an alliance, the priority has been 
uh, in recent years, and of course this has been accelerated since February, how to bolster our deterrence and defense posture. That means concretely more troops uh, strengthening, thickening our eastern flank. Of course, you've seen that we've gone from four to eight multinational battle groups, increasing the aerial assets, investing in air defenses, really uh, investing in a multi-domain high intensity fighter concept so that we are prepared and we are able to credibly defend and deter against all types of uh, contingencies. It's of course also about how we need to continue investing more in defense. And that's of course not just, uh, that. that's something that applies more on this side of the Atlantic, but in general is how we need as Europeans to do more for our own security and defense and for our neighborhood and that in that, in that in, that involves uh, investing more, spending more in defense, in, in investing in our own resilience, strengthening our own, uh, our, own criti- our own ability to uh, to protect our own critical infrastructure, minimizing our strategic vulnerabilities and dependencies, and of course. Today, it's about energy dependency on Russia, but tomorrow it may very well be about uh, making sure that we're not dependent for critical uh, assets, uh, technologies on China, for example. So it is a very broad, uh, overarching, uh, strategic mindset shift, I would say, that that, that you can find in, in, in the strategic concept, but more broadly, that I think is is going uh, on at the moment, in uh, hopefully on both sides of the Atlantic. Of course, there's still work to be done, but in but I think the starting point is the recognition that some of the peace dividend and some of the um, some of those privileges that we have been able to to take for granted over the past uh, few decades, especially as Western Europeans, are no longer on the table, and that requires a much more deliberate investment on defense and a much more deliberate understanding of how we can compete in a world of strategic competition and uh, prevail against aggressors. So I think that's a little bit the broader strategic thinking behind what's happening uh, in the alliance. And that's all for five minutes, but of course, happy to go more into the details of how we're doing that on the different files. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, towards questions, uh, we will uh, ask them after all the all the speakers uh, will do their presentation. But uh, you may raise your hands uh, because uh, it will be in order uh, the, the the first hand uh, the first question. Uh, so uh, thank you, Benedetta. Vladimir, uh, you are. The expert, the researcher from Ukraine, with a precise focus on uh, Black Sea security and so on. And uh, now my country is conducting the war, the criminal aggression against your country. And uh, this aggression is destroying. Ukrainian security and Black Sea security and uh, eastern flank of NATO security uh, and so on, global security at all. Uh, so uh, what is your thoughts about all these things, about the future of the European security? Thank you, Pavel. Uh, and uh, thank everyone who was involved in organizing this event. Uh, primarily, obviously, the Russia Eurasia program at the Fletcher School and uh, Arik Burkowski. And I'm looking forward to be with you in Boston in person uh, really soon. Uh, I just received my uh, J1 visa today. I'm in Warsaw and Poland now, and the uh, American embassy in Ukraine is not issuing visas. But that's a little technical detail. That's what happens when you have a war in a country. And uh, I'll be flying over on Sunday. and. Uh, in next week, we are taking part in some events in person in Boston, hopefully. So, um, uh, answering your question that you just had for me, Pablo, I would say that not only this war is um, destroying our security, it's uh, kind of destroying Russian security and Russian future in many ways, uh, definitely altering that future in many ways. In terms of Ukrainian security, actually, I think, uh, ironically enough, uh, Ukraine might come up stronger out of this. Uh, because uh, there is a major consolidation uh, here in Ukraine. Uh, the political nation that we had prior to February 2022 is now stronger. The people are more united, there's more resilience, uh, there's more of this consolidation and so on. Uh, obviously, we have uh, terrible destruction of our economy and infrastructure and so on. Uh, 
But in terms of a long-term security, Ukraine might even got stronger because we also have very experienced and mature and uh, now well-trained military. We're also getting a lot of existence from the West and uh, nuclear, I mean, not nuclear, not, not nuclear yet, but maybe at some point, uh, weapon supply, weapon supply uh, as well, and uh, moving to standards, uh, or NATO standards, frankly. So in many ways, uh, when uh, someone who turns uh, 70 today says that Ukraine is a de facto uh, NATO matter, man, member, uh, it's probably true. <laughs> we are a de facto NATO member, uh, but he only has uh, himself to blame for that. So <laughs> that Ukraine is moving so quickly uh, towards uh, being so uh, advanced in interoperability with NATO and uh, using NATO weapons uh, and using NATO tactics and uh, and learning so much actually from various trainers and so on. But uh, security, longer term security is uh, an interesting subject here, obviously. And uh, I actually have a bunch of very concrete questions I was forwarded uh, prior, prior to this event. So I'm gonna actually address some of those. Uh, I'm a disciplined guy, you know, if I had a, quite a, have a quest, quite a list of questions, I, I have to address them, but uh, uh, in the long term, Ukraine security, of course, needs to be organized somehow differently uh, to what it was uh, prior to February 22, because after all, it didn't work for us. I mean, uh, whatever it was, uh, and basically it was uh, a lot of nothing. Uh, Budapest Memorandum, we learned quite quickly, it's not working. So we were looking for some kind of security arrangement for the future. Now in Ukraine, we don't want Budapest Memorandum too. We want something more feasible, more efficient, or more prudent that will help us to withstand the future uh, Russian invasions and attacks. Of course, we're not quite done with the current one, but we understand that the nature of uh, Russia's uh, attitude towards Ukraine will hardly change even after this war is over and there'll be more invasions, there'll be more attacks and there'll be more offensives and we need to be more mindful and better prepared and uh, work with our allies and our friends uh, in the West uh, in terms of preparing better, uh, preparing Ukraine better. So, uh, we will continue, we understand, to uh, receive military assistance uh, from various uh, allies. Uh, and the first question actually on the list of my questions is, how long might the willingness of the West last to provide military assistance to Ukraine? I think it might last for a long time. Uh, I think uh, yeah, there is an understanding that uh, the Ukraine's war against uh, Russia, defensive war the, the, uh, that the Ukraine wages, uh, is uh, against Russia is uh, something that is of interest and in interest uh, and uh, of, of broader Euro Atlantic space. And that's why Ukraine deserves to receive uh, military assistance. Uh, what kind of military assistance? That's, of course, uh, open up for debates uh, because uh, it's a very much a debatable issue. What does West want uh, uh, as the end game of this war? Uh, what, what is the defeat of Russia or what is the victory of Ukraine? How do you find it? Can you actually get there? Can you achieve it? Uh, because there are all sorts of different shades and types of how you can define defeat or victory. Uh, but uh, there is clearly an understanding that, uh, you know, that people are trying to teach Russia a lesson and they're trying also to help Ukraine to withstand this aggression. And therefore, there will be some military assistance. But what kind of assistance, what scale, how, how long, we'll see. Uh, apparently, at some point of time, of course, there will be some tiredness about uh, giving too much weapons to Ukraine, uh, giving too much uh, financial assistance to Ukraine. There might be some people who are disappointed about sending too many, too much money to, to Ukraine, and we are already hearing these voices, including the United States and so on. But uh, we'll see how it goes, and uh, NATO will continue to play an active role. I mean, of course, it was a major wake-up moment for NATO, and I think NATO have done really well in terms of uh, addressing this uh, current Russian aggression uh, for what they have to do is to provide security, obviously, for their eastern flank members. And that's been, uh, uh, there have been some dramatic steps and shifts in that particular respect. Uh, we'll see where it goes, but of course, NATO is much stronger now, much more mobilized, energized, and uh, basically alert uh, in many ways uh, than it was prior to February 2022. So, I mean, uh, even after 2014, uh, I remember people were joking that uh, there should be out, uh, outside of NATO or HQ, there should be a monument to Mr. Putin because he actually gave a new life and a second breathing moment uh, to NATO. But uh, ever since, 
February of this year, of course, I mean, maybe we should multiply and put more of those uh, monuments because uh, NATO is now very much uh, 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 re-energized in many ways. Uh, and of course, there are new members joining, and that's another question, like how would Russia react to Sweden, Finland joining NATO? That's an interesting question because apparently uh, Russian political class is not alarmed by this. Uh, I wonder if Yuri would like to address this question as well in his presentation, but uh, this is interesting because after all, it tells us that uh, uh, whatever Russia was telling prior to February, that they are don't, li don't like uh, expanding NATO, I mean, expanded NATO on their doorstep. It probably wasn't about NATO, it was primarily about Ukraine. So when Sweden and Finland joining, doesn't alert much or alarm Russia, uh, but whatever uh, very a remote possibility for Ukraine to move closer to membership was, was something which was alarming to Russia. So, But I assume that, of course, there will be a future uh, of NATO's open door policy will remain the open, open door policy. And uh, Ukraine uh, will continue knocking on that door. I mean, we're not naive. We understand we're not having any uh, clear uh, opportunity to proceed along this path in any coming immediate future. Uh, well, there is some uh, politicizing of this issue, obviously, as you probably know, some of you that but several days ago, Zelensky actually formally submitted this application to join NATO, but to most of us understand that this is primarily more of a domestic political issue in many ways. And also uh, one of the you know, levers to apply more of psychological pressure on Russia. Because as uh, we remember, prior to February 24th and in the first days of this massive invasion, Zelensky actually indicated that, well, we are willing to make a statement that we're not going to become a NATO member, or maybe even sign some kind of a binding agreement. But uh, since uh, the war, uh, this last seven months, the situation has changed. And actually, uh, the longer term opportunity for Ukraine to join NATO in the future is back on the table. We're even hearing from Washington now people saying that, well, who knows? I mean, maybe Ukraine should be considered as a potential member. And that's uh, one of those unwanted uh, implications and unwanted results for, for Moscow, for Mr. Putin of this war. And he's getting many of those. Uh, and one of those is that, uh, well, the idea that Ukraine should become a member of NATO one day in the future is back, is back on the table. Um, well, uh, what can bring to the end fighting between Russia and Ukraine? Uh, I think uh, liberation of Ukrainian lands. Uh, and of course, frankly, I can say that there are discussions within Ukraine and with our Western allies, what that would mean. Uh, are we trying to go back to the borders of 1991 or pre, let's say pre-February, pre-spring 2014? Are we trying to return to the what had uh, been our borders with uh, uh, regard to before February this year? Uh, there are discussions, and uh, frankly, of course, there are offensives uh, that the Ukrainian military is undertaking in various directions. And we all hope in Ukraine that there will be successful offensives, even though they cost us a lot. The price is steep. We're losing our, our best and brightest, our, our defenders, uh, Ukrainian armed forces. But they're moving forward, and there is a high morale in the country, and there is no appetite for concessions whatsoever. Our sociological polls are showing that Ukrainians, of course, are tired of the war. Uh, and many are IDPs and refugees and economies and ruins, but yet uh, there is no appetite at all about uh, bringing this and prematurely to the uh, to the war at Russia's uh, uh, conditions or so, you know, meeting Russian conditions or demands. There is no appetite for that. And uh, frankly, Zelensky as well, it's not Putin's case when he makes all decisions like himself sitting somewhere in a bunker. Zelensky is the president of a democratic country. It's open in the political system. He has a position to deal with. He has the parliament, he has media, he has public, he has military now. Uh, none of them that I've just mentioned would be too happy if President Zelensky, imagine for a moment, decides, okay, I'll sit down and sign some kind of a peace deal with Russia tomorrow or before the end of the week and uh, give them some of the Ukrainian lands. But that would quickly uh, lead to his uh, ratings, uh, you know, diving decreasing rapidly because right now, of course, his ratings are up in the sky, but uh, he would be very unpopular very soon if he does so. So that's another issue here. So he's not, he's limited what he can do, uh, you know, and the most finally, I think um, uh, on the final questions in my list that I have in front of me, and I'm looking at it now, uh, there is of course a, a risk of hostilities uh, spilling over beyond Ukraine and Russia. Uh, if there is always an opportunity for an escalation, and uh, the whole debate about escalation is a fascinating debate. Uh, I would love it more, frankly, if it would be about a different country, not my own, but uh, other than this, uh, you know, escalation works in different ways, like 
For instance, the Washington has been saying we shouldn't be giving Ukrainians some weapons that would be pushing Russia to escalate so that they we didn't get attacks, we didn't get uh, jets, we didn't get tanks and so on. Uh, what does Russia do in return? They escalate. They do so-called referenda, they do so-called annexation, they do partial mobilization and so on. So that's another lesson to us. Like, you know, if you're replying to bullying by Moscow by, uh, you know, giving them the off-ramp, uh, you know, an exit strategy and allowing them to de-escalate, instead they escalate. So I think it's quite a, quite a teaching moment there for everyone in the West that well, we need to be prudent and uh, actually not is enough pressure on Moscow if you want to be successful. And uh, most finally, I think uh, that uh, there is, of course, uh, the threat of uh, WMDs being used in Ukraine. Everyone is focusing on nuclear weapons, but of course, Russia has big arsenal of uh, chemical weapons and biological weapons as well. They might be used as well, not just nuclear weapons. Uh, if the tactical nuclear weapons are used in Ukraine, there'll be several things. I mean, there'll be definitely an escalation. And that wouldn't be the end of the war. In fact, it will be leading to even more anger in Ukraine uh, and, uh, you know, even more uh, calls for revenge uh, here in Ukraine, uh, uh, directed at Russia. Uh, there will be more of an involvement of the West, uh, what I'm hearing, uh, even he being here in Warsaw, that uh, there are clear plans uh, to retaliate uh, in more decisive manner if uh, Russia indeed decides to use nuclear weapons. So I hope uh, that this plans and the message being conveyed clearly to Kremlin by Washington and Brussels and others uh, that they shouldn't do it because otherwise uh, they might quickly actually be without any Russian troops in Ukraine because of a massive strike uh, of the predominant military force, uh, NATO force. Of course, that would be leading to us, you know, the open, open this Pandora's box of a future uh, broadening of the conflict, uh, internationalization of the conflict, and maybe a third world war. No one wants that. Uh, but uh, letting uh, Russia use uh, some kind of WMDs without any responsibility would be also be very irresponsible. So I would probably stop here. We are here, of course, in the middle of this big war, grinding war in Ukraine. We understand it's not going to end anytime soon. Uh, no one is happy about it. It has a very personal toll on each and every family in this country. Uh, but uh, thinking about security long term, it might be, like I said at one point already today, surprisingly, paradoxically, some benefits and some positive implications for Ukrainian security as we go forward. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, yes, you draw uh, not so optimistic pro prospects for all of us. Yes. Um, so, Yuri. Uh, you are also visiting scholar here in Fletcher, but uh, recently you worked in Russia, in Russian academia for many years. So uh, what is your take towards the European security in times of this awful illegal and criminal war that our country is conducting? Uh, well, uh, 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 thank you very much for having me and giving me a floor. Uh, well, it's 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 not, not so easy to proceed after the, these two brilliant uh, contributions by the two uh, speakers uh, we've just heard. And uh, so I try to add uh, uh, some suggestions to this overall uh, discussion. Uh, because, well, the, the topic, the future of European security is too wide, of course, and there are many aspects of that. But um, I, I can briefly describe my vision of the situation, and that then I try to focus on uh, Russia's incentives uh, and um, uh, try to analyze, uh, just in brief, uh, because no option, no options we have because of uh, lack of time. Uh, what was the reason for the for this war? Uh, but uh, if we uh, if we uh, just uh, take a, a brief look at the security situation in Europe in in last three decades, well. Uh, we can say for sure that the picture of the, that uh, kind of European security that was emerging after the Cold War was uh, 
I may say I was quite optimistic, but we, we heard a lot of pessimism from uh, uh, our prominent speakers. And I agree that now we have uh, these uh, reasons for these pessimistic uh, views and maybe predictions. But uh, let me be clear that uh, last three decades, uh, or, or I can say even last two decades, uh, on the eve of 20th century, the picture was not so gloomy as it uh, now uh, seems to be. Well, and it, it will not be an exaggeration uh, to say that after uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall and uh, the Soviet Union and dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, there was a, a great opportunity to build uh, uh, Europe whole and free. And that was real concept that was not far from reality, actually. Europe was in unprecedented peaceful condition that, the, uh, conditions that time. And uh, uh, in contrast uh, to, uh, for example, uh, uh, pre-war periods in, tw in the 20th century, I mean, uh, pre-war period uh, prior to war World War I or prior to World War II, there was a diff different situation, of course. And nobody was... Uh, actually talking uh, seriously uh, about the any any uh, forthcoming indications that uh, uh, could show us uh, that there are any uh, resentment from uh, Russia uh, as a great power because actually Russia remained uh, its uh, place as a great power uh, it's a permanent uh, seat in the UN Security Council in status as a nuclear power, and and and, and these uh, attributions of the great power uh, it uh, had before, uh, or in the time of the Soviet Union, despite that the, the Union itself uh, uh, dissolved. Uh, but uh, 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 what, what we uh, what we've seen last decade uh, was. Uh, uh, the picture that could, could could hardly be described by geopolitical concepts, because well, uh, if we just try to use these geopolitical concepts, uh, it could be quite difficult to understand why this war, a war between uh, Ukraine and Russia, or if it, to put it more in in, in a more uh, wide context, um, uh, the war. Uh, the war that Russia um, uh, leads not only against Ukraine, uh, but uh, as uh, Russian authorities believe themselves that they are fighting with the United West, with the unified West. And uh, uh, actually, uh, this picture is far from reality because it exists only in the public consciousness. I mean, in the minds of the decision makers. In contrast, uh, for example, to the situation of prior World War One, World War Two, because well, you know, journalists uh, and uh, uh, columnists they are threatening us with uh, World War Three. But uh, just uh, uh, take a look uh, at the conditions; they are uh, very uh, different from that times. Uh, well, you know, prior to World War One, there was uh, two military coalitions, two military blocs, and they were fostering this war actually. They were uh, preparing for that war for decades, actually, and that was a, I mean, uh, that was a huge attempt to revise the uh, then uh, uh, world order. Uh, uh, and the same, actually, the, uh, I mean, the similar picture. Uh, well, of course, it it, it was different, uh, uh, different to that of uh, pre World War One situation. But uh, to some extent, it was similar. I mean, uh, uh, pre World War Two situation. Then we we saw uh, another two military coalitions that uh, actually amassed a lot of power, and that was uh, actually. Uh, an attempt to change the ba the basics, the essentials of the uh, world uh, world order, and now actually we don't see anything like that. Uh, we we don't see uh, anything similar to that situations because we see this this Russian revisionism, and uh, it is uh, fed only uh, it is being fed 
uh, uh, only by uh, by uh, scares, uh, by uh, resentments, resentment feelings, uh, by uh, a political elite uh, or a majority of this political elite, uh, by, by decision makers, key, key uh, figures uh, uh, in uh, uh, um, political uh, system uh, of Russia. Uh, uh, on the political stage of Russia and majority of public uh, who support uh, this uh, resentment uh, incentives uh, um, that uh, uh, captured uh, minds of uh, political uh, uh, decision makers. Uh, but actually, um, uh, but actually, uh, we we don't see that that it is really uh, that it is really a. Uh, uh, real uh, uh, geopolitical uh, situation that can be explained in, in, in purely uh, uh, um, international relations concepts, I mean, uh, political rights, because not, not, no one threatens Russia nowadays. Uh, objectively, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the same situation. And uh, we don't see any indications of uh, creation of these uh, military coalitions or blocks that could wage this uh, uh, World War III, we, we, we see the opposite uh, position of China, uh, that uh, uh, position is far from, uh, far from the uh, playing muscles. I mean, uh, well, uh, they try to distance themselves from, from the situation. It's not a military war between China and Russia nowadays. So uh, what is my focus? What is my, my point, uh, just uh, before I finish, that now we, st we still have this uh, local, conflict between Russia and, and, and Ukraine. Of course, this conflict, uh, uh, external players, they contribute to these conflicts as well. But do we have to say that this contribution means that uh, this inevitably will lead us, will uh, bring us on the edge of uh, global conflict? Uh, I uh, uh, cannot say, uh, definitely that uh, we uh, will be uh, sooner or later uh, uh, in that situation. Uh, th that is possible that uh, uh, we will see an uh, escalation, uh, but uh, whether we have branded uh, as a, a kind of new global conflict of World War One, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Well, I have, of course, much to say about that, but uh, unfortunately, lack of time. But if you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them uh, during our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, thank you, all the speakers, for being sharp. And uh, uh, so let's turn to Q&A session. And as a moderator, uh, I'm going to take my privilege uh, and to open the first round of questions. So uh, I do have a couple of questions uh, to, to you, Benedetta. Uh, my first question is, uh, how long, in your opinion, might the willingness of the West to provide military assistance to Ukraine last? And my second question is, uh, how is NATO's approach to China now changing? And uh, in your opinion, could NATO play a role in the Indo-Pacific military balance? Because I know uh, you, you were engaged into uh, Asian Forum for Global Governance Program. So maybe you, you have a take. So the, the, floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'll be brief. I'll start with I'll start with China, and then I'll move on the on the second question about how long uh, how long do I estimate we're gonna we're going to maintain and sustain uh, support to Ukraine. Uh, so first on China, uh, I have I think that the the we have to start by saying that there's been a substantial evolution in how the alliance is looking at China. Uh, if you would have uh, perused uh, allied declarations and policies before 2019, you would have been hard pressed to find the word China. For example, the 2010 strategic concept didn't mention the word China with a single word. It simply was not there. Uh, but a lot has changed in the last few years. Uh, at the end of 2019, for the first time, NATO brought China on the table and allies talked together about, at the time they were talking about the 
the impact of China's rise on, on, on uh, Euro Atlantic security and challenges and opportunities. That was the frame in 2019. Fast forward to the latest strategy adopted this summer, and I think you can see that there has been a substantial conceptual evolution in how we think about about uh, about China in general in the context of strategic competition more specifically. And here we are with the with the with, with being very clear at the beginning that NATO at the moment doesn't frame China as a military adversary. That's very clear in the strategic concept. At the same time, the alliance is also clear that uh, China's stated policies, stated objectives and coercive policies can be seen as a challenge to our security, to our values, um, and to our democracies. So that's already a characterization of looking at the China challenge. Uh, moreover, there's a description of what, what these activities are from, uh, uh, from hybrid cyber activities to, uh, uh, I would say, assertive military modernization with, uh, relative, uh, with, that, with relatively lack of transparency, lack of engagement in arms control. There is, of course, a specific reference to leveraging economic eft and, web and uh, um, strategic dependencies and utilizing them in the context of exerting uh, global, global influence. So there's, there's a description of some type of behavior that is seen as potentially challenging to the alliance. There's a reference to the PRC as posing strategic challenges. So that's very important to your Atlantic security. So there is a really big, I would say there's a big shift here. And the, the, that doesn't mean necessarily to go to your question that the next logical step is for NATO to expand and let's say have a military footprint or presence in Asia Pacific. That's not necessarily the, the next step. The next step and what we're doing now is situational awareness, consultations, intelligence sharing, building a common picture, building a transatlantic convergence over how we approach this challenge. That means increasing our resilience, building our preparedness, working with like-minded partner, including in the Indo-Pacific, uh, investing in cyber, in cyber security and cyber defense. So there is a broad set of uh, things we are doing that are about increasing our resilience, increasing our preparedness, having more transatlantic convergence when it comes to the China uh, challenge in the context of strategic competition. So I would say that that's probably one of the most interesting uh, transatlantic conversations to follow when it comes to, to the future transatlantic security. So I think a lot is happening. Then on your second question, uh, which is how long, uh, if paraphrasing, how long will the, will the transatlantic alliance, but you mean uh, individual allies as well, continue to support um, Ukraine in exercising its right, its right to self-defense? personal, I've been a Dutta's personal opinion, my two cents, if we know what's good for us, and I think we do, we will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Because uh, we are very clear, I think, I think, or if we're not, we should be extremely clear about the stakes here. Uh, of course, uh, from from, UK, from Ukraine's perspective, this is a war, uh, this is about self-defense, this is existential, this is a war of uh, of necessity against a brutal and unprovoked aggression. That's absolutely clear. And the, the credit, uh, the credit for the, the the incredible advances in the in on the field goes entirely to them. At the same time, I think we should be very clear that what happens in Ukraine is not just about Ukraine. It's about the European security order at large. It's about uh, the rules-based international order. In a context of strategic competition, we can very well imagine that everybody else is watching and studying how are we reacting? How able are we to be resilient, to be strong, to be credible? Uh, I could go on and on, but if I want just to make it short, if we understand the stakes, and I think we do understand the stakes, we will continue to support Ukraine by continuing to isolate the Russian Federation, by supporting sanctions, by providing the military assistance that is absolutely necessary uh, to, continue, uh, to continue consolidating the, the extraordinary gains we're seeing over the last days and weeks. Um, and I think we will do that for as long as it takes, because um, let's be very clear, we can have different conversation and there were, I think very, there is a very interesting conversation to be had about what does victory means? What does day after means? We can have all that, but there has to be a strategic defeat because in 2022, it has to be very clear that you cannot invade your neighboring country and wage a brutal war of aggression. That has to be, I think that, that lesson has to be learned 
uh, for us to be all able to move forward towards a European security order that is peaceful uh, and stable. If we don't do that, I don't think there's peace or stability for us or for Ukraine. So uh, I'm, this is my personal opinion, just to be, but I also think it reflects very well the alliance, pol the political momentum. We will support Ukraine. It will be difficult. Uh, but it will not be difficult, it will, and the Secretary General has been saying this, I think, uh, very clearly. We will pay a price in terms of uh, inflation, in terms of public protest, but the price we're paying is nothing compared to what Ukraine is paying. They're paying with their lives. We have to pay with our remaining steadfast and making some sacrifices. I think it's entirely worth it. Um, so, yeah, that would be my two cents. Brilliant. Thank you, Benedetta. So, uh, Vladimir, my questions uh, to you. In your opinion, uh, which countries and regions in Europe um, uh, are most threatened by Russia? Maybe Transnistria, maybe uh, Romania, because of uh, missile defense base in, in Constanza, uh, or maybe, maybe South Mediterranean. Uh, see and countries like Libya that are unstable uh, or that may play, you know, a tricky game. Uh, what do you think here? And my second question is, what could bring about an end of the war? Maybe, as President Zelensky told, uh, the change of power in Russia, uh, change of Putin by some by, by someone else or maybe uh, some po political changes uh, in the united states because uh, upcoming um, elections in congress um, may may change the balance uh, between two two two, two parties yeah. uh, currently right. yeah in Washington. So, so what is your opinion? Yeah, here? yeah I'll be brief. Uh, well, on the first question um, uh, is uh, in terms of threatening uh, what regions are threatened. I think it's quite obvious. I mean, first of all, neighboring regions. Uh, second of all, um, countries of Central Eastern Europe, uh, South Eastern Europe, including Balkans, by the way, in different ways. Uh, some are threatened uh, with a direct military confrontation uh, by Russia, maybe some other by hybrid uh, attacks. You know, for instance, uh, in Balkans, it's more of a subversive operations and so on. Um, in terms of Baltics, it could be a direct attack, it could be hybrid, it could be something like defending rights of Russian speakers in, in Estonia or somewhere else, you know, something like that. So it could be different, it could be Finland too easily now, uh, even though, of course, Finland is a very strong opponent. Frankly, I should say that uh, Russia is weakened now dramatically, so their capacity to wage uh, this kind of a war or aggression against anyone else is very limited. I mean, and for that, uh, of course, uh, Ukrainians should be complimented and congratulated and thanked. Uh, but I mean, at the same time, we are thanking those who are sending us financial assistance and weapons because only at with heroism and resilience, but with empty hands, uh, only with sticks and stones, of course, the Ukrainian military wouldn't be able to defend themselves. So, so I mean, it goes both ways. Uh, they, but, you know, this weapons and citizens being sent to Ukraine uh, is defending the broader Euro Atlantic space, obviously. And uh, here in Poland, I, I mean, I just, I'm just surprised. I've been here for five days. Uh, to some extent, I'm surprised. I mean, I know the mood here and the attitude I expected it to be, but it, they basically see that they're on war. You know, they, they, they don't even see it as an aggression against Ukraine only. They actually see it as an aggression in some broader space to which Poland belongs. And therefore, they understand, you know, that, that when you see the news on the, on the TV set, I put it with the TV set at front and above my head, uh, you know, here in Poland, it's, it's almost like, you know, they're reporting on the war that their own country is involved somehow. So, yeah, and uh, anyone is in danger. I, I can remember that how in 2008 people said, okay, Russia will support South Ossetia and Abkhazia, but they would never go into the rest of Georgia, and they did. And then the people said, okay, Georgia is a separate case. Uh, you couldn't imagine Russia using military against Ukraine. In 2014, they did. You know, and there's always a thread line. So whenever someone says some, you know, so it would, this would never happen, think again. You know, never say never. So everyone is in danger. And uh, but uh, Ukraine has uh, delivered at, at huge cost to my country a very serious blow. 
the Russian capability of waging the war. So, so we'll see. And uh, and the second question was, uh, can you remind me? Yes. Uh, what could bring about an end of the war? Maybe some yeah, yeah, political right. changes in right. in Russia. Right, right. Yeah, I remember now. Thank you, thank you. I remember now. So, yeah. Uh, well, uh, obviously, the change in power in Russia would be, uh, I think, conducive to the end of the war. Uh, I'm not personally, you know, believing this line of thought that uh, someone worse than Putin might be coming to power. I don't think so. I think uh, by uh, default, uh, if Putin goes, that would mean a major instability within Russia, political infighting, uh, definitely under the war, uh, you know, lack of political will to continue the war and so on. So there would be a good thing, good way out for us. And uh, I think at least a big major pause in the war, if not the end of the war. Uh, but then uh, some kind of a defeat of Russia. But then again, it's very relative to this term. Victory, defeat, what do you mean? I mean, uh, will we be able to see the end of the war or some kind of, uh, like I said, pause and then continuation of the war? What's it going to be? It's going to be frozen conflict. It's going to be maybe something like was in Donbass for eight years since 2014. Or will it be just uh, really the end of the war when you know the, the, the clear boundaries will be established and Russia is going to is going to respect those boundaries? I, I, I'm not sure. I just don't know. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to liberate our lands uh, and uh, be preventing Russia from uh, grabbing more of our lands, and that's how it will end. But uh, there's no clear clarity about that. That we can we be able to do it. I'm trying to be frank. I mean, no one here is in Ukraine is naive to the extent uh, that uh, you know we think it's going to be easy for us because it hasn't been easy seven months and it's not going to be easy coming on. So, but we are hopeful. The morale is high, and uh, and uh, Ukrainians are definitely not so willing to give up. Thank you, Vladimir. In my personal opinion, uh, being a Russian citizen, uh, I, uh, I I believe that as soon my country will stop this war, as better uh, it will be uh, as to Ukrainians as to Russians. And uh, also, of course, the end of war will mean that uh, must mean that Russia will back to its internationally recognized borders. Uh, I mean, without without all this annexed territories, including, of course, Crimea. So, uh, so thank you, then. And uh, my question, a uh, couple of questions to Yuri. Uh, uh, first question, uh, how is Russia reacting to Sweden and Finland joining NATO? Vladimir told us that uh, uh, it, it, it is not a problem for the Russian elite. But uh, what do you think here? And my second question is, uh, how does the Russian-Ukrainian war affect uh, global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation? Um, yes, uh, what, uh, that's, that's, that's an interesting uh, issue uh, with respect to uh, Russia-Scandinavian relations, because you know, uh, I remember that uh, when I, I uh, took participation in, um, that was, that was probably uh, the last uh, 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 event of that kind that took place uh, in pre-COVID conditions. It was nine, uh, tw uh, 2019 and it was in uh, Finnish embassy in Moscow. And uh, then uh, Finland took uh, its presidency in, uh, in EU. Uh, if uh, you, you remember that that is a rotational basis uh, presidency, and uh, that uh, actually I addressed that that questions to to my colleagues uh, on both uh, Finnish and um, uh, Russian side, and what I heard from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Russian MFA Minister of Foreign Affairs officials and uh, from from Finnish colleagues, but uh, what Russians say. And actually, uh, no one denies that, that uh, Russia actually was prepared for that step uh, uh, taken by Finland and by Sweden. They were not surprised. And uh, uh, there is a, a, a consensus, well, actually, among decision makers that uh, actually de facto uh, NATO membership of Finland and Sweden uh, took place long before. Uh, uh, their formal accessions to NATO. 
uh, well, uh, if uh, uh, we uh, take into consideration that uh, that uh, they uh, both uh, signed uh, this so-called uh, host nations uh, agreements with NATO, which uh, 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 gives an opportunity for allied forces to uh, deploy uh, their troops there. And uh, actually, uh, we uh, have to keep in mind that uh, Swedish uh, as well as uh, Finnish uh, military programs, they were deeply integrated into allied uh, decision-making procedures, actually. And uh, don't forget that uh, uh, Scandi countries, the Nordic countries, uh, they uh, established a kind of uh, enhanced uh, military cooperation and defense cooperation within NORDEFCO, which actually uh, uh, will actually consists of both neutral, priorly neutral Sweden and and uh, Finland uh, and uh, Norway and and uh, and Denmark. Uh, who are the main members of NATO. And that was a good bridge actually to cooperate. So there were multi-channel cooperation system established uh, between uh, Finland and Sweden with NATO. And uh, actually, well, uh, Russia uh, 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 knew about that very well. The uh, Russian authorities were, were aware, uh, aware about that. So uh, the reaction was uh, uh, was um, expressed uh, by uh, top officials, including Putin himself. What he said: "We don't have any problems with uh, these uh, uh, neighboring uh, nations, uh, Sweden and Finland. Uh, we don't have border disputes with them." Well, of course, it's not. Uh, uh, it cannot be seen as as a as a truth, uh, but uh, mostly it's truth. But uh, not, of course, it's not a, uh, it's not in full uh, uh, truth. Uh, it's not a truth in full. Uh, but um, uh, uh, that's really uh, a kind of uh, uh, an attempt to keep uh, uh, to keep. Uh, 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 Russia's uh, uh, efforts uh, um, uh, focused primarily on Ukraine because otherwise you have to react uh, on the steps taken by the uh, by, by the North Atlantic Alliance. And what are you gonna do actually? If you uh, well, if you have problems on the battlefield, and you 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 are obliged, you are uh, you uh, you have to. Uh, uh, withdraw your uh, troops and uh, uh, military deploy and uh, 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 weaponry from uh, 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 northern borders, uh, the, the, even those uh, located uh, not far from uh, Finnish borders to Ukraine, because otherwise, uh, well, uh, you, you don't you don't have any options. Either you just uh, redeploy your forces and your weaponry from the north to the south uh, uh, or you just uh, uh, disseminate your forces and you uh, cannot uh, achieve any goals so if you if you if you move forward here you know, for example our cruise missiles are Iskanders or something else to the Finnish border or oh, that's okay but they are needed in Ukraine actually so I don't see any military response right now, if, uh, if to be brief. Uh, a political response, I don't see them either. Well, we, at least we don't uh, uh, hear now uh, any uh, statements uh, uh, that were uh, um, voiced by the, by the Russian authorities that they uh, are going to threaten Finland and Sweden somehow. Maybe they will, they will try to provoke them, but they did it before actually. Just remember that, that case with uh, the Russian submarine in uh, um, uh, Stockholm Air Hippolago. Um, uh, that uh, happened uh, several years ago and there was a huge uh, uh, history uh, in uh, Swedish media about that, uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, Russia will uh, take uh, any uh, serious uh, any uh, 
uh, aggressive steps against these two nations uh, with respect to their journey into NATO. And uh, uh, the second question uh, was, uh, Pavel, will, will you remind me once again? My second question was, how does the Russia-Ukraine war affect uh, global nuclear disarmament? And uh, uh, well, uh, actually, what, uh, I don't think uh, I don't think that that this war uh, completely uh, destroys uh, uh, nuclear arms control uh, agreements, uh, as they actually were destroyed prior to that war. So actually, we can we, we can say that now arms control in a deep decline, and that happened not because of that war. Yes, of course. Uh, this war uh, contributed to that decline to some extent, but actually, if uh, the decline was prior to war, uh, can we say that that uh, the war itself uh, was just a, 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 a final accord that buried these uh, arms control agreements under the earth? I, I don't think so. Um, uh, what we see now, we see that this war actually uh, make, uh, makes uh, a great, great restrictions on uh, any prospects to find any way out from this situation. So um, this is a, a kind of uh, uh, an endspiel an, an uh, uh, in uh, uh, arms control uh, process uh, uh, across the globe. Uh, and and uh, especially if we are talking about strategic arms limitations. And um, uh, so uh, despite the situation on the battlefield, either Russia uh, will take this hor horrible, uh, horrible uh, decision to use uh, a nuclear, technical nuclear weapons or Either uh, Russian authorities uh, uh, keep their uh, uh, the remains of uh, the uh, common sense in their minds, and they they will not do this. But despite um, despite uh, that, uh, in any case, uh, I I don't think that that we uh, can uh, uh, restore and uh, reverse the uh, 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 arms control uh, uh, agenda that it was uh, like it was uh, even not not uh, not uh, pre in pre-war period but uh, like it was uh, for example a decade ago then where the the we, we saw this a number of these attempts to move forward on the track of uh, for the uh, nuclear uh, disarmament uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, ambitious uh, uh, ideas were uh, voiced uh, like uh, Global Zero and so on and so forth, and New START Treaty, of course. And uh, we don't see uh, any indications that uh, this agenda might uh, come back somehow uh, in a foreseeable future. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's, turn, let's give uh, voice to our audience. And Nate, uh, he's waiting for so long. Uh, and I presume uh, his question uh, is precisely to Benedetta, but uh, Nate, you may ask uh, uh, any, any other speakers. Unfortunately, Vladimir uh, already left, uh, but uh, okay, you may ask Yuri and Benedetta as well. Well, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paolo. First of all, thank you for the speakers. Uh, we really enjoyed this opportunity to, to hear your thoughts. Uh, you're right, Pavel. My question is to Benedetta. Um, I had the opportunity to be a part of the U.S. military delegation to NATO from 2017 to 2019. And while I was there, NATO was very much so concentrating on the NATO, the new NATO military um, strategy, as well as the command structure. Uh, and we've developed both of those things. Uh, also, while I was there, I saw that there was large disparities between what the country blocks were interested in. And what I mean by that is predominantly the southern countries of NATO were very interested in refugee flow and security across the Mediterranean, while the eastern bloc countries, the Baltic specifically, were concerned about Russian aggression, as you would expect. And then the, the, the Atlantic countries were a little bit more concerned about China and, and not really sure what, what would be happening with NATO. Uh, so Bernadette, the, the two questions I have for you are, uh, 
what is the review of the NATO command structure? Is is it working? Did, did, the, did the, the policies that we put in place then you know, turn out to be fruitful? Uh, also, the strategy, is the strategy good? And then finally, how have uh, those regional focuses changed? Should I should uh, should I um, should I attempt an answer? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so first of all, thanks for the questions. They are obviously uh, very, very pertinent. Uh, let's start with the with the with the point about uh, different uh, strategic prioritization. And I, I mean, I think that's uh, that's always going to be a fact. Uh, of life in the alliance uh, in the sense that, the, and of course, the more the alliance grows, and now we're going to be 32 countries, uh, I think you're going to always have this balance between the fact that I, I, I strongly believe at the broad strategic level, there is a broad convergence. We have uh, we have common values, common strategic object, uh, objectives, and I think that's what keeps the alliance strong and resilient. A resilient, but of course, at the same time, when you ask to prioritize threats, where you sit is where you stand. So we have different neighborhoods. And of course, the security environment of Estonia and the security environment of Portugal or Turkey or Canada are fundamentally different, even though we have shared convergence. So that's always going to be reflected, and that's always going to be part of the political uh, of the political debate. And that's why NATO, and that's why NATO is, as you know very well, a political military alliance. Because at the end of the day, we are always balancing, on the one hand, operational effectiveness, which is really really important, but just as important, unity. And you always have to square the circle. So that means that when we address our security environment, you always have to look. And that's this awful expression we love to we love to use the 360 degrees. I hate the expression, but I strongly agree with the point that we have. If during the Cold War we had, in a way, the luxury of focus on one theater, one threat, one actor, that's gone. We can't do that anymore. And that means that, uh, especially if I look at a world of strategic competition, yes, our direct uh, the, the new strategic concept is clear. Right? The Russian Federation today is a direct threat to our security. So that will be, will have to take a lot of our time, of course. But at the same time, we cannot forget that terrorist groups continue to threaten, continue to represent a threat to our citizens, that we have hybrid, uh, hybrid cyber attacks, that there is a rise in China, that there is a security impact of climate change, which is not even anything to do with any actor. It's a global trend. So it's going to require some, um, continue to require some political skill to manage all of this. At the same time, I think we have a clear compass, if you wish, and that is we have a clear mission that is security and defense of allies. So that means that uh, every each and every security threat we look at, we have to look at them through the lens of how do we protect the alliance, which I think helps in focusing. But yes, you, you're absolutely correct. The more the world is, com is complex and interconnected, the more prioritization will be a political challenge. Um, I think so far we're navigating it well. And paradoxically, this awful, brutal war is making it very clear what we're up against and focusing, I think, and creating a momentum of unity that we that is very very strong but just, but yes in other words i completely agree with the uh with the point that we'll have to keep balancing and on the ref, on the command structure new concepts everything down culminating in this new 2022 strategic concept which kind of codifies and moves us forward i would say I mean, of course, I'm biased. I'm, I'm here at the HQ. I'm not going to say that we did a bad job, but I also don't honestly don't believe that because um, I, I I haven't been here for for decades, but I but I, I have been able to observe the shifts over the last few years, and I'm sure the year based on the years you were here, you saw this too. This reset to collective defense that we started in 2014 has really meant a great deal, specifically. Uh, after uh, after the after the February twenty fourth uh, war against Ukraine started, we were able to activate our defense plans within hours. This is something that we didn't have before twenty fourteen. We hadn't been we hadn't needed to think through those dynamics of collective defense for decades. So if I look at where we were and I look at where we are, I think we have really really moved forward. We have concepts, we have doctrines, we have plans, we have uh, 
we have and we and and just to make it concrete, we, we don't have, we don't just have paper plants. We also have troops deployed, aerial assets, my, my, air, land, and sea, space, cyberspace. So it's I think it's happening, uh, but it's not over. And I think one one of the main tasks we have at hand after this new strategic concept and the last summit is we're setting a new baseline. We're not going back to pre-20, pre-February 24th baseline for our defense and deterrence posture. There is no going back. We need to thicken our flank. We need to bolster our presence. We need to pre-deploy more. It's 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 happening. Uh, we can debate, of course, the what more, what else, but in terms of the direction of travel, I think very much we're going in the right direction. Uh, Perhaps you could say we could have started earlier. It's always, but uh, <laughs> uh, we can always have that discussion. But I think having been there, uh, as you said, during those years, you know how uh, how much of a strategic shift it was to push through all these changes. And I think we're seeing that it was really important that we did and and, and, uh, and we're allowed to continue and push through. Uh, thank you, Benedetta. Thank you, Nate, for your brilliant question. And uh, Rockford Waits, uh, if I, I am correct, uh, sorry if I'm not. Uh, so, sir, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, your question to any of other speakers. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Pavel. And thank you also for coming yesterday to our talk on uh, Taiwan. Um, it's great. First of all, I'll just say it's really nice to see uh, Dr. Benedetta here, our Fletcher PhD. Uh, keep up the good work. Um, so I just was, so here's my question. I just have been starting reading this book, the beginning of the, the end of the world is just beginning. I'm going to read you, this will only take about 20 seconds. So, uh, um, so 2019 was the last great year for the world economy. America made that happen, but now America has lost interest in keeping it going. Global spanning supply chains are possible only with the protection of the US Navy. The US American dollar underpins internationalized energy and financial markets. Complex innovative industries were created to satisfy American consumers. American security policy forced warring nations to lay down their arms. Billions of people have been fed and educated as the American-led trade system spread across the globe. All this was artificial. All this was temporary. All this has ended. And I agree with that. Um, and I think the most, so I, I'm a believer in peace through strength. Uh, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat. I just think peace through strength uh, is uh, data, uh, evidence-based supported. Um, and uh, as I read the news, I hear that uh, NATO countries, including the United States, are running out of ammunition. We heard yesterday that Taiwan is totally unprepared for war. Um, and I view this uh, not to be uh, harsh to our European friends and allies in NATO, um, but that uh, the free ride on American security ended maybe seven years ago or longer, at the very least, probably uh, at least five years ago, uh, but it's over. And uh, and uh, we are not um, in a position to execute on peace through strength. America is guilty too. Um, and uh, we uh, Reagan wanted a 600 ship Navy. Uh, we have a less than 270 ship Navy. Many of our most recent platforms are overpriced, ineffective, uh, and it do not exude deterrence because they don't work. Um, and so our missiles are expensive. Um, and I, I think that uh, there was some commentary yesterday at Fletcher that uh, Xi Jinping is quite pleased that the US missile inventory is at its lowest uh, in recent memory. Our ammunition is low. Um, we are not ready. We don't even say we're ready to, to fight on two fronts. Um, and yet Nancy Pelosi flies to Taiwan. I mean, it's just like, a uh, geostrategic thinking from the 80s and 90s um, by American leaders with a uh, without the peace through strength military capability of the 80s and 90s. So um, I am frustrated by US leadership um, or lack thereof. Um, I am frustrated by allies who aren't pulling their oars, haven't been since 1991 or so. Um, and I think it all has to change, unfortunately, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, because trust is really low. And so the big question I have, 
uh, for all who want to answer it, um, is how do we get to a more stable world that's peaceful um, uh, through strength? Because I do think there's merit to that idea uh, without stumbling into an actual hot war with China or Russia, because I think that's in nobody's interest. Uh, so I threw some bombs in there, but I, I'm excited uh, to uh, hear your responses. Yeah, thank you, Rocky. Benedetta, the floor is yours. Well, there's so much, first of all, hi. <laughs> no, there's so much to say, but uh, first the point where I, First, the the point of agreement, uh, and that is the the this notion of of uh, the the time. And I think I said it in a, in a different way, but I did say the the uh, the peace dividend we have cashed in. It's been nice, but it's not going to continue. And I think that's just to to not to contradict your analysis, but to offer the other side the the glass half full but without without trivializing or or say or, or or saying that there's room for complacency I don't think there is um, but I think what we are seeing and uh, in a way this process has been really uh, sped up since February is that the penny is dropping the penny has dropped uh, of course there where you sit again your different European countries will be in a different stage but you are seeing many many allies uh, first of all all allies are, spend, are spending more in defense since 2014 uh, this is this will be the eighth consecutive year in which we are on an upward trajectory there's been a roughly 350 billion added by by uh, Canada and European allies to our defense budget. So the, the trend is not bad. Uh, also, when we start looking at what we're spending on, you see there's more acquisition of high hand cap high hand capabilities for high intensity fighting. So I think there there are good trends that I want to put on the table just to say it's not all bleak. At the same time, as I'm just as worried as you are. Uh, of us not following through, uh, because right now, of course, there is a huge political momentum. And I think you've seen it. You see the Zeitungwende, you see the extra 100 billion in Germany. You see many countries uh, in the eastern flank going to spend 3%. You, you see that there is a movement. But we need it to continue. We need it to be sustained. We need it to be sustainable. And of course, that's not super easy because we're going to go into recessions. We're going to go into kinds of economic turmoil. There's inflation. There's an energy crisis. But uh, but I think in terms of the looking at the bigger picture, there is really no alternative. We cannot. We have as Europeans, and now I'm talking as a European, we have to take a greater uh, ownership of our security. I think that the signs are good, but it's not over. It's the beginning of a long, it's, I think, it long overdue, long overdue transformation that I think has been, has happened since 2014, but it really has been accelerated over the last over the last year. Um, and of course, we also have to think of the broader geopolitical game. You're absolutely right. Europeans need to do more in the European theater. And at the same time, I think, and this is my personal two cents, we need to be more and more aware about the, the connections between the two theaters in the Pacific and your Atlantic. They're not separated. Uh, perhaps in terms of military planning or response or assets, we can think differently, but in terms of how they both are instrumental to our shared prosperity and security and democracy, I would say. I think there's strong connections. That's one of the reasons also because you see NATO more and more working with our uh, Asia Pacific partners, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea. So I think we are, um, we are in the right direction, but I also think it's really important to have, uh, to hold, uh, <laughs> To hold ourselves up to scrutiny and to and to be as blunt as possible when we're talking about uh, about the importance of preserving the credibility of our defense, um, uh, especially when we are in a confrontation with authoritarian powers, would seem to respond quite well to strength and quite less well to to anything else. To be to be perfectly honest, um, and then just the last point, and that is about the the military. Um, our military industry. And I think here you're absolutely right, but we are taking steps both in the NATO context, in the EU context. Uh, the, the, the thinking is uh, we were not 
mentally prepared for an all uh, out war in the middle of Europe, going through the, the type of um, the type of ammunition that are used in a week in Ukraine. It's something that we haven't thought through for decades and decades. So we have to think it through. That means that means also revising some planning assumptions. All of that is happening. But it is also true that our industry is having trouble keeping up with the demand and uh, stocking and backfilling will be an issue. Uh, I, am conf- I am confident that the more we work through this together as, as a as transatlantic community in the European context, the better. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's an issue. Uh, we have an industrial capacity production problem and we need to generate the right incentives. Um, it's not trivial. It's not trivial at all. Uh, but uh, I close with this. It's, it's, it's also not an, it's also here. I, I don't give ourselves a complete pass, but I also would say, yes, there were many signs that this was going to happen, but the extent and the scale and the scope I, I don't think I, I don't fault us too much for not having anticipated that. Uh, of course, hopefully that's a lesson learned for the future, uh, and we will not have similar failures of imaginations. But uh, yeah, we're catching up. So thank you, Benedetta. Uh, everyone else wants to ask questions. Oh. Uh, yes, probably, Pavel. Uh, yeah. I uh, I have a question to Benedetta. Uh, well, uh, she described uh, this uh, very uh, in-depth picture of uh, uh, NATO uh, concept. Uh, uh, how to how NATO is going to do with these threats and challenges it is facing nowadays? But uh, I wonder. Uh, uh, was I, I recently published a small article on uh, this uh, new strategic concept, and I was wondering um, to what extent this idea of comprehensive uh, approach was uh, uh, was was really a good idea of NATO? Because well, you mentioned, and I agree with you entirely, that NATO uh, was uh, concentrated on. Uh, very multifaceted uh, challenges uh, from um, environmental protections to human rights and um, uh, any kind of so-called non uh, non military uh, challenges um, within the uh, wide spectrum but um, uh, it was less concentrated on a primary goal actually defending, uh, its territory and uh, member states, actually. So military might was really a problem for NATO. And uh, uh, in this respect, um, uh, c- can you just uh, uh, provide your, uh, your thoughts about that? Do, do NATO really needs this uh, comprehensive approach anymore? Because you cannot uh, go it... Uh, um, like you did it before, you mean you, mean, you, you cannot just move on um, in this multi-directional. Um, uh, you you may not form this multi-directional uh, strategy as as you did it before. You know you know you you don't have resources for that, but maybe it's uh, uh, time to uh, reevaluate and uh, rethink uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, multi. Uh, dimensional uh, approach, so-called uh, uh, comprehensive approach, because, well, if you are going to do everything uh, at the results, uh, you uh, cannot do nothing, actually. But th- there, is a, uh, there is a high risk that uh, you can face this real. Yuri, may I ask you to, to be brief and to, to give uh, your question to Benedetta more shorter way? I- I'm, I'm done. I'll be also very brief. That is a very, I mean, that that's that's a really important debate that we're having. And and there is a dilemma. On the one hand, I completely agree with you, and I think that's what we're doing. We are, when I say we're collect, we're focusing back resetting to collective defense, I see there is a really concerted effort uh, to uh, to do what's mission critical. So what a mission critical is whatever is necessary to defend the allies. So I think that on so on. This is the first point. We're saying yes. We need to focus. We need to take care of issues. Uh, we're not an organization who look for a problem to solve. We have a clear mission. So if it affects our core, uh, if it affects the security and defense of allies, we need to 
um, to think about it. So that's, I think the parameters are clear. So yes, I agree, uh, being dispersed is not useful. At the same time, we don't live in a world where things are easily compartmentalized. And certainly our adversary are not thinking like that. And that's a little bit the paradox, right? On the one hand, yes, you're absolutely right. On the other hand, if I think about uh, Russia's strategy to seek to weaken and divide us and undermine us, well, it really uses all the tools in the toolbox. It's about energy dependence, energy blackmail, and manipulation of our, of our elections, uh, cyber attacks, uh, uh, political assassination, espionage, I, all the tools in the toolbox. And that makes it difficult for us to say we're only going to focus on the military dimension because the military dimension these days is really interlinked with a number of other factors. At the same time, I think we need to be focused. So I'll give you an example. Resilience. To me, resilience is something that we need to do more of and to be really put at the front and center of how we think about deterrence by denial. That doesn't mean that every single aspect of resilience is NATO related. But for example, uh, civilian infrastructure, you could say, well, civilian infrastructure has nothing to do with the military or with defense, so leave it only to, I don't know, to the EU. In theory, yes. In practice, 90% of the, of the roads and bridges are military needs are owned by civilian, uh, either by private actors or by civilian, uh, civilian ministries. So we can't simply say, well, it's civilian, so we don't look at it. Instead, we have to make sure that that structure is fit for purpose, that meets our military requirements. And of course, when I use roads and bridges, it's easy. But these days, we don't just need roads and bridges. We need civilian satellites. We need 5G. We need uh, secure telecommunications. We need to make sure that our critical assets are not owned by uh, potential competitors that are going to use them against us. So it is really tricky how to draw the line. Uh, I think the way we're thinking about it is NATO takes a lead role, of course, on the core, but it serves as a political platform for allies to come together, share intelligence, and forge common policies on the others. So not necessarily always see NATO as a first responder, and many times working with others. That's why we're working more and more with the European Union, for example. But the, the, the separation becomes harder and harder. And I think the energy crisis to, that we are seeing in, in Europe, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate but very illustrative case study of how everything is affecting our security. So we have to look at it in this holistic way. But I also take your point. We can't just be doing everything. Otherwise, we have no focus. So that's what we're trying to balance. I don't know if I... It's, it's a complex question. We can have back and forth for a long time. Uh, so say, thank you very much. And uh, I see that uh, Oleg uh, has a question. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, this session and the presentations. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, I'm wondering uh, to what extent NATO uh, can and does work with uh, third countries. Uh, it's not a secret that indeed uh, the enemy uh, doesn't seem to compartmentalize into NATO, non-NATO, and instead they, they use the avenues in India, Sri Lanka, China, uh, many, many other countries uh, across Asia and Africa. And I'm wondering if there is a role for uh, the NATO to work to uh, counter uh, those uh, those subversive uh, and unfriendly actions of Russia. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really, I mean, that's 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 another really important question, of course, about what happens in our neighborhood also affects our security. I think in terms of, uh, I think there's many aspects of this. This one is, I would say, the, the lead role is taken by individual allies in their relations with uh, countries that are not NATO partners. Uh, but at the same time, one NATO has a network of NATO partners that is very robust at this point. We have over 37. They go from, uh, as I said, from the Indo-Pacific to Colombia and from uh, Morocco to Azerbaijan. So we do have a network of partners we work with. Of course, it's work based on mutual, mutual benefits, um, mutual political dialogue, mutual cooperation. So the parameters are very clear. But at the same time, we're also thinking more and more about how do we interact 
with those countries that have no interest in being NATO partners, but with whom we could have security dialogues over certain uh, specific topics, um, being climate change and security, being countering hybrid threats. So we're doing a lot of thinking about that, and we are doing some initial some initial reach out. Of course, it's nimble. It's it's nimble, and the majority of the efforts I think will continue to be with the allies where they should be. But I also think there is another dimension to what we do that is very important, and it is the intelligence sharing and situational awareness building. And that's something that we've been doing very deliberately and very diligently, I would say, not just with respect uh, to Russia's um, activities around in and around Ukraine before the war started. That's It was incredibly important, I think, to have NATO as a political platform to share that intelligence and have that conversations prior to, to the start of the war to get the transatlantic community on the same page. But we also do that sharing intelligence and, and situational awareness over the broader activities uh, of potential, of not just Russia, but also other potential actors, uh, states and non-states who are engaging malign activities in our broader neighborhood. So even having this platform where you can share the intelligence between the countries, compare notes, see who's doing what, I think that's already a valuable tool. Of course, it's not enough by itself, but I think that's a really important function. And we do that more and more. And we're looking really global in terms of in understanding interdependencies and looking at all theaters. And I stop here. Oh, so thank you very much, Benedetta. Uh, and uh, I presume that it's time to conclude our meeting. And maybe Arik uh, wants to say a couple of words to us at the end. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for this conversation. I wish it could go longer because there were so many interesting things said. Uh, thank you to the panelists, uh, Vendetta, uh, Vladimir, Yuri, for your insights. Pavel, uh, thank you so much for uh, moderating. And uh, uh, thank you to the audience for joining us. Please join me in a round of applause for uh, our uh, speakers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, again. Bye.